Thank you. Um, yeah, so as Mark said, I'm Nicholas Quinn. And uh, you'll have to forgive me because some of my notes are actually missing. <laughs> so, yeah, last thing that could have gone wrong. But that's okay. I'd like to begin today by asking everyone to visualise what they think a muscle looks like. Okay? And if you're like me, and most people, I think you'll imagine something like the picture on the left. You'll see an attachment, an origin, an attachment, insertion, I mean, a muscle belly, and that's generally how we're taught our anatomy. I think also most of you know that in fact, it tends to look a little bit more like the picture on the right. Okay? And what's the difference between these two? Well, the picture on the right just has the phasia still in it, and the picture on the left is obviously a drawing. <laughs> but um, it's also just a representation of the muscle tissues, the important muscle tissues as we've been taught them. And what's the benefits of teaching muscles like we do on the left? Well, there's a couple. Mainly, it's very clear. It's easy to define anatomical groups. And it's very easy to determine the function of these muscle fibres when classed as a single group. However, one thing we do miss when we present muscles in such a way is fascia. And fascia is quite an interesting topic of research lately. What if I told you that fascia is not the passive structure that we often assume it is? And what if I said that fascia was even capable of changing its rigidity in response to its environment? By that I mean a study found that if it took it out of the body and applied a mechanical stress, it actually increased its tensile strength after the next mechanical stress. There's also some evidence to suggest that fascia might possibly be able to actively contract. That's early evidence, but some people liken the, um, sorry, some people say that the causes of Diputrens disease and frozen shoulder may be respond, or the, the fascia may be responsible from a dysfunction of its contractile features. And this is quite amazing. And as you can see, fascia is quite messy, uncontrolled. It is literally expanded throughout the entire body. So much so that muscles don't attach just to bones like we think, but they also touch to other soft tissues. As we can see in this photo, this is, oh, you probably can't, but I'll explain it to you. This is the attachment, or this is the tendon of the gracilis attaching in the pes anserinus, as we've learnt it. But interestingly, when you leave the crural fascia there, you can see that when the dissector applies a traction, that a tensile force transfers all the way down into the calf complex. Now this is quite, not revolutionary, but quite interesting. And a lot of research is being done by anatomists now and physiologists about what the effects of such transfer of force could be. But very little has been done on what the clinical implications of such force transfer or such features of fascia might be. Thomas Myers, who's a manual therapist, has written quite a popular book in, uh, which is titled Anatomy Trains. And in Anatomy Trains, he maps out places in the body where facial continuity is particularly discernible. And what that means is where these connections are particularly strong. And he argues that these connections can actually transfer force over the joint lines. One such connection that he la maps out is the superficial back line. And the superficial back line runs from the plantar fascia, along the calves in the hamstrings, along the spinal extensors, and finishes at the epicranial fascia of the skull. And he argues that these lines are well, you can influence all the muscle and the function on these lines by an intervention into any area that may be dysfunctioning. <coughs> and to prove his point, or to make his point, he suggested that a myofascial release of the plantar fascia can improve the, a person's ability to touch their toes, which essentially is their hamstring extensibility and their lumbar spine uh, capacity of flexion. So for my thesis, I tested out this exact intervention. I took 42 students from here at Fontes, asymptomatic students, and I divided them into two groups. One group would have performed a myofascial release with a golf ball into the plantar fascia, right, sort of like a massage technique but self-performed, 
And the other group acted, initially they undertook a placebo, and then they acted as a control. And I measured with the sit and reach test. I measured with the sit and reach test because it was much more quantifiable than a toe touch test. So there were two phases to my um, study. The first phase was just one intervention, and that's when the control group used the sham. And the second phase involved a week where the intervention group performed the intervention twice daily before being retested on the final day. And what did I find? Well, I found one intervention had no effect on sit and reach test scores when compared with a, sh with a sham. There was another study who found it was effective, but I've probably put that down to placebo effect. Interestingly enough though, over a week it's a slightly different story. There's no significant effects of this, however there's quite a discernible trend in my data. Of the 21 participants in the intervention group, only two failed to improve after a week of this intervention. This is compared to the control group, whereas 9 out of 18 did not improve, which is almost what we could expect. And the reasons, for why, uh, the reasons for such low significance could be explained by the huge degree of natural variability that we saw in the control group. As you can see from my graph on the right, some of the largest improvements in my study came from people in the control group, with the largest person improving almost 15 centimetres week to week. So this naturally has a strong effect on the validity of my findings. Um, other reasons why my results may be a little bit uh, unreliable, particularly that I made no attempt to control the active environment of my participants. So when testing range of motion in any degree, right, one must have relatively consistent um, activity on the day before and environmental conditions. Due to practicality, that was something I was unable to do which is limited how much I can really draw from such a, or how many conclusions I can draw from my study. So what's for the future? Well, the future really requires a lot more study into what are the potential implications of phasial connectivity. If soft tissue interventions can alter or improve function in another area of the body, or whether they yeah, can influence anything at all relating to the adjacent areas of which they can act. With my particular intervention, first and foremost, to investigate further, one would need a much larger sample group, right? probably looking towards the hundreds for, to get any sort of real idea about, um, well, to control for that natural variability that we saw in the control group. And additionally, um, sorry, additionally, attempts should be made to obviously control activity and maybe to control the warm-up to a stretch in the sit and reach test. The evidence that we've seen in fascia over the last probably two to three years has been so monumental at shaping conversation more than anything else in anatomy. And such evidence and such conversation cannot ha not have clinical implications. So I'd like to ask everyone in some capacity to go out and have a look at the new evidence and see what you think. Be critical, but be open to the possibility that there's some things that we're not looking at. Thank you. Any questions?